a privilege to be here. Um, privilege both to have heard all of the papers thus far and especially to have been asked to speak to you on the topic of revolution, continuity and legal validity and that having been what I was asked to do, it is in to some extent what I propose actually to do. Um, I thought that I would start by um, posing a multiple choice question because all important issues of legal philosophy and political theory can be reduced to multiple choice questions. And so the question that seemed appropriate for today was to ask the question of when the Irish state was founded. Um, was it founded in A, 1916, B, 1919, C, 1922, D, 1937, E, 1949, F, none of the above, or G, all of the above? Um, and probably if I was thinking if I'd been a bit more controversial, I could have put 1973 in there as well, just to see if that would provoke a response from anybody. Um, and I suppose the obvious answer is that you can, you can make a case for any of these, and your answer depends not just what you think about Irish history, but it depends on what you think a state is, and really what I want to address in this paper, what is the relationship between laws and the state? Um, what I hope to do is to use theories of law and theories of the state to better understand this period of Irish constitutional history that we're focusing on today, um, but also to use Irish history to better understand what laws are and what the state is, and the hope is that through that sort of process we'll come to some sort of equilibrium of understanding by the end of the paper. As I say, that is the hope. Um, what I want to present to you is two frames of analysis, two ways of thinking about these sorts of issues, and then to use those either as a frame of analysis or as a lens to look at this period in Irish history, um, hopefully to understand it better. I think in a, in a way that's cutting across a lot of the papers today, I can already see quite a, many points of intersection. The first one that I'm going to look at, I'm calling it this, I'm calling it a populist or a statist account of constitutional authority. And what I mean by this is the basic idea is that people create a state and the state creates a constitution. Okay, and that's I'm going to explore that in more detail. The alternative account <clears throat> I'm calling legalist or constitutionalist, um, and the basic idea behind that is that it is laws that create the states. So the basic dichotomy is does a state create its laws or do the laws create the state? Okay, which is there first, if you want to put it in temporal terms. So, first taking the populist or statist account um, and bringing back into mix the idea of popular sovereignty that has already been mentioned uh, today in Mr. Justice McMenamin's opening address. If we, Martin Lachlan, the, um, the English legal theorist and political theorist, um, says that we can date the idea of popular sovereignty to the English Civil War. And there was a political problem. The problem was how to argue against the divine right of kings. And you need some other locus of authority that you can assert against the right of monarchs. And that's where popular sovereignty came into the equation, so sort of as a, as a leverage point um, against monarchy. You see it again in the French Revolution. Obviously, they had a bit of a problem with the divine right of kings as well. And Cies, in his uh, political tract on what is the third estate, he said, the nation exists prior to everything. It is the origin of everything. Its will is always legal. It is the law itself. And what you get from Cies is a reasonable theoretical working out of this idea of um, the nation having this power that it can assert. Um, but it's not, I mean, Cies was a political activist. Okay? It was being done for a political purpose. And I think we see the best theorized or the best worked out account of what I'm calling this populist statist view if we move on to the German uh, legal theorist of the 1920s and 30s, um, somewhat went to off the scene in the process of denazification after the end of World War II, of uh, Karl Schmitt. Okay? So Schmitt's idea is around what I'm calling the political unity of the people. And it's set out in one of his more respectable works, Constitutional Theory, dating from 1928. Um, what I'm going to do is just run through a, a couple of quotations. I'm just I'm using PowerPoint. I don't usually use PowerPoint. I hope it's going OK. And there's no pictures. There's just a lot of text, so sorry about that. Um, but just to use it for some of these quotations, which then try to 
summarize in a few minutes. Um, well, actually, probably about 45 seconds. Um, so these are the ideas that Schmidt has around the political unity of the people. And essentially, um, what it is, is a sense um, that you have a nation or a people which is existing, but they sort of will themselves into existence as a political unity and as a state. And they do that through their sheer force of will. Okay? And when they are there, when they, they articulate their political unity as a constitution. Okay? Um, but they, this sort of people slash state, precede that constitution. Um, and Schmidt frequently uses this phrase, the constitution in the positive sense. And what he means by that is, or what he is distinguishing it from better, is what he would refer to somewhat dismissively as the Reichstag constitution. So the constitution that has those bourgeois values, such as the separation of powers and the protection of fundamental rights. He concedes that you can call that the constitution. That's another part of the constitution. But for Schmidt, the more fundamental sense of constitution is the constitution in the positive sense, which is where this uh, strong political entity, and he's I'm phrasing it all in terms of the people, and I think that was Schmidt's main focus, but he makes clear that this could just as easily be done by a powerful prince or a monarch or so on. Um, but you have this people which assert their political unity, and they put it into a particular constitutional form. And therefore, for Schmidt, the important part of the constitution are the bits that say, we the people give to ourselves this constitution and a certain value such as popular sovereignty, and that sort of gets cobbled on to a more legalistic type of constitution. Um, and I think maybe just to understand this a little better, what Schmidt is getting at is if we line them up, and that's actually be a good name for a legal case, I've just realized, but anyways, um, Schmidt's main sort of legal theoretical opponent in the 1930s, uh, Hans Kelsum. And Kelsum conceived of legal systems as being systems of norms. And for Kelsum, the only thing that could give validity to a norm was another norm. And so Kelsum said that sort of at the apex of a legal system, we must presuppose another norm that gives validity to all of the norms of the legal system. It's not a real norm, it's not necessarily a morally justified norm, it's just whatever norm that we can hypothesize that makes sense of all of those other norms in the legal system. And Kelsen referred to that as the basic norm, the grund norm. Schmidt, and I think the reason the diversion into Kelsen is to make this clear about Schmidt, Schmidt says in contrast a constitution is not based on a norm whose justness would be the foundation of its validity. A constitution is based on a political decision concerning the type and form of its own being, which stems from its political being. Um, and this, fair enough, okay, but what's also important to bear in mind about Kelsen is that he does view constitutions as genuinely normative, okay? So he does view constitutions as creating legal obligations for those who are, sorry, as creating moral obligations for those subject to them to follow the laws established by that constitutional order. Um, so he says, the political decision reached regarding the type and form of state existence is valid because the political unity whose constitution is at issue exists, and because the subject of the constitution making power can determine the type and form of existence. The decision requires no justification via an ethical or juristic norm. Instead, it makes sense in terms of political existence. So for Sch Schmidt, there needs to be no to, if you ask yourself about the justification of a constitutional order, you're not asking about its justness, you're not asking about the justice of a norm that underlies it. Instead, you're simply asking, was there a constitution making power out there with the sheer political will and force to bring this constitution into existence? Um, a little bit more detail on whom does Schmidt regard as the people. This is not an exercise in deliberative democracy. Um, what Schmidt says, in his book is the natural form of the direct expression of a people's will is the assembled multitude's declaration of their consent or their disapproval, the acclamation. Uh, I think if you picture a Nuremberg rally, you get pretty close to what Schmidt had in mind when he was talking about the popular will bringing itself into existence. Okay, so all acclaiming this great idea of the people having this political unity and creating the state for themselves. 
as an expression of that unity. Um, so that's the, na I'm going to call it, yeah, the populist, populist statist view. An alternative way of thinking about this, a more staid way of thinking about it, builds on the work of um, analytical jurisprudence, uh, particularly the work of the legal theorist H.L.A. Hart. Um, and Hart's basic idea about legal systems was, in one sense, similar enough to Kelsen. He believed that legal systems were systems of rules, okay, and all of the rules were connected to one another in a systemic fashion. Um, but whereas Kelsen hypothesized this basic norm as the thing that held all of those other rules together, uh, for Hart, all of the rules were held together by what he referred to as ultimate rules of recognition. And what an ultimate rule of recognition is, and I'll unpack these in a moment, is a conventional practice of legal officials recognizing certain norm normative propositions as law with reference to certain criteria. So the idea is that there's a shared practice among legal officials of treating things as law because they conform to certain criteria. Um, the example that Hart gave in response, respect to the United Kingdom was that legal officials in the UK had the shared practice of recognizing as law whatever the Queen in Parliament makes as law. Okay, so that's Hart's basic idea. And that he says that for every legal system, he equivocates on this, but I think if we read him the best way or slightly improve him, every legal system will have a small number of ultimate rules of recognition which the judges and other legal officials subscribe to and which they share um, and which identify what counts as law within that system. And for, I'm pushing it slightly further, Hart again slightly equivocal on this point, I think this practice is conventional. So what I mean by conventional is that the practice isn't simply shared but that each of the legal officials um, takes um, as part of their motivation for conforming in this practice the fact that other people are behaving this way. Okay, so the fact that other people are recognizing law according to this criteria becomes part of the motivation for other legal officials to recognize law according to that criteria, those criteria. So they're sort of mutually regarding. Um, so how does this relate then to constitutions? Okay, well, I think what the ultimate rules of recognition do is that they identify one of three things as the basic source of authority for the particular legal system. It could be the acts of a particular legislator, as Hart gave the example in relation to the United Kingdom. Um, it could be a particular constitution, so the ultimate rule of recognition might be that this constitution is law and everything that flows from that. Or it could be um, the act, or it could be a particular constitutional author. And this is, I think, where we start to reconnect with the, the Schmittian worldview. It's very different from the Schmittian worldview, but for instance, you could have an ultimate rule of recognition that recognizes a certain people as having authority to enact a constitution. The implication of all of this is that it's laws that create the state. Okay, so the implication of the Schmittian way of thinking about it is that it's the state that creates laws and the constitution. The implication of this method of thinking, the legalist constitutionalist position, is that it's laws that create the state. Okay, laws create the constitution and the constitution creates the state. In the same way as there's a normative account associated with Schmitt that explains how um, constitutional orders can create moral obligations on people, we can develop a normative account that relates to this legalist description of, legalist conception of constitutional authority. And this turns on the normativity of conventions. So to take a simpler example not related to ultimate rules of recognition, if you imagine that we live in a world where there are roads and there are cars, and these cars are not driverless cars, um, but there's no written down rules of the road, okay? And a practice emerges of cars driving on one side or the other side of the road. Um, that practice is conventional if it's not 
simply a happenstance, but part of the reason why people drive on one side of the road is that everybody else is driving on that side of the road, okay, if they're motivated. So that's what's meant by conventional practice. They're looking at what other people are doing and treating that as a reason to behave that way. Conventions can be normative if they, by normative I mean they can be normatively binding, they can genuinely impose obligations on people if they solve a coordination problem that needs to be solved, as is the case in this road driving example. Bad things will happen um, if people don't drive reliably on one side or other side of the road. Okay, there'll be car accidents. So because that convention of which side of the road to drive on solves a coordination problem, we can make a leap and say that um, people have a genuine obligation because of that convention to drive on that side of the road. Okay? If the convention were otherwise, so if it were driving on the right, people would have a genuine obligation to drive on the right. The convention in this country happens to be drive on the left, therefore people have a genuine obligation to drive on the left. And I think um, we can make the same point about ultimate rules of recognition, which is that they solve what you might call a meta-coordination problem of how do we know what the law is. Okay? And we need to know what counts as laws if laws are to be able to perform this coordinating function. And a conventional ultimate rule of recognition is a way of solving that problem of knowing what is law. And to that extent, um, gives a prima facie justification for con functioning constitutional orders. Okay? Um, basically, it's a way. It's very simply just a way of knowing what's going to count as law in a particular system, what actually is the constitution that applies to a particular territory. Because it's, you think about it, it's not a question that you can ever answer just by reading the constitution. So the constitution of Ireland says it's the constitution of Ireland, but I could write a document here to say this is the constitution of Ireland and nobody would think that it was. Okay, so it's only through or at least one way of knowing what the Constitution is, is relying on a conventional practice of accepting that as being the Constitution. Um, this is a fairly minimal justification uh, for the validity of a constitutional order. It's minimal both because it's a relatively low bar to meet, it's a relatively low threshold to show, well, look, if there's a functioning system with a functioning constitutional order, then probably it's a legitimate one that ought to be followed because it's solving this coordination problem. But it's minimal in a second sense, which is that it's only a prima facie justification. So if the constitutional order were significantly unjust, the obligations that it generates uh, might not hold good. So that's where, that's how you would frame an argument, for example, about apartheid era South Africa. Okay, it had a functioning constitution in one sense, but it was a radically unjust constitution. And for that reason, therefore, um, the obligation that would normally come with a functioning constitutional order quite possibly did not arise. It's also, um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not a typo, it's just an unpleasant word that I made up. Um, it's a presentist justification in that it focuses our attention on what a legal system is doing for us now, okay? Is it performing a useful function for us now, rather than the Schmittian justification, which uh, focuses its question of justification on was this made by a powerful person at some point in the past or a people asserting themselves as a political unity. So the, the legalist view, um, oddly perhaps, eschews any root of title approach about the validity of legal systems. Legal systems may be valid if they're working for us now. It doesn't depend on who made them in the past. Okay. Let's then look at uh, some of the events in Irish history, Irish constitutional history in this period, and try to bring these different theoretical lenses to bear. Okay, um, 1916, the proclamation, if we read the proclamation, the basic claim behind it is that it's either Ireland or the Irish people acting through the signatories to the proclamation who proclaim the Irish Republic. Um, there's already been reference to the constitution of the first ball, very, as was pointed out in the last paper, very much a document about organizing parliament or organizing the assembly and its ministers, but still some sense of it there in saying legislative powers exercised by deputies representing the Irish people. 
Okay, so that's some sense of popular representation coming into it. Um, when we move on to the Irish Free State, we have to take two different views about its constitutional authority. So there is the Irish view, um, which in outline holds that the Irish people hold the constitution-making power, um, and the third doll as a constituent assembly, so as an assembly exercising that constitution-making power on behalf of the Irish people, makes the Irish Free State Constitution. And we discover in 1935 in the state Ryan versus Lennon that the Irish Free State Constitution, because it was made by that constitution-making power, can only be amended according to its own terms. And therefore, the entrenched provisions, so there were provisions in the 1922 Constitution which had to respect the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty and which the Constitution and its act set could not be changed. The Irish Supreme Court comments in state Ryan versus Lennon, that means that they can never be changed, at least not within this constitutional order. Okay, so those were things like the oath of allegiance to the crown, the right of appeal to the Privy Council, the role of the Governor General, etc., etc. Um, we also see rhetorical statements in the Constitution and in the Act that made it that have already been alluded to by John in his paper about where power comes from, popular sovereignty, power under God from the people, those sorts of things are floating around within the 1922 Constitution, but are a little bit difficult to square with also the assertion that the Constitution cannot be amended in a way effectively that um, the British don't agree to, okay, uh, in terms of the settlement of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. But there's still some of these claims to popular sovereignty are being made. If we look at the Irish Free State from the British view, we see something rather different. The Westminster Parliament is sovereign. It's the Westminster Parliament that enacts the Irish Free State Constitution Act 1922, putting into a Westminster Act the act that had been agreed on by the Third Doll in Dublin. Um, the Statute of Westminster of 1931 amends the Colonial Laws Validity Act, as a result of which the Oireachtas, now as a Dominion legislature, can amend any provision of the Irish Free State Constitution Act. Um, and so we see then in the British case of Moore versus the Attorney General of the Irish Free State, the Privy Council coming to the exactly opposite conclusion about the power of the Irish Oireachtas to amend the Irish Free State Constitution. So the Irish Supreme Court thinks that the Oireachtas cannot amend the treaty provisions of the Constitution. Um, the British Privy Council thinks that the Irish Oireachtas can amend the treaty provisions of the 1922 Constitution. Um, and that, as has already again been alluded to, that Statute of Westminster is causally important in explaining at least how de Valera got away with the dismantling of the constitutional connections between Ireland and the UK, although of course it was never something that de Valera could cite as his authority for doing that, because for de Valera, obviously, Irish authority to legislate had to come from the Irish people and could not be conceded to have come from Westminster. Um, Westminster, however, in 1930s, notionally retains authority to repeal the Statute of Westminster and reassert jurisdiction over Ireland, uh, an authority which in some notional sense remains there. If we look then to the 1937 Constitution and how it was made, I think we need to distinguish between the rhetoric and the reality of that. So the rhetoric appears in the preamble, we have here, we the people of ERA, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this Constitution. Article 1, the Irish nation affirms its inalienable, indefeasible, and sovereign right to choose its own form of government. But the reality is hidden away in Article 62. One of the less well-known, and for obvious reason, features of the Irish Constitution is that there's a number of hidden articles, articles that are not allowed to be published in the official version of the Constitution. Um, we keep on adding more of them. We recently added an Article 64 to deal with transition of transfer of cases from the Supreme Court to the Court of Appeals. So God help you if you're trying to find Article 64. It's not allowed to be published, um, but it's there. It's a reprehensible constitutional drafting strategy. But you can see why they wouldn't want Article 62 to have been seen, because Article 62 says the Constitution comes into force um, when it's voted, when it's approved by the people at a plebiscite held in accordance with law. And then you think, well, in accordance with which law? And that would be the Plebiscite Draft Constitution Act 1937 made by the Free State Oireachtas, which set out the circumstances about the plebiscite for this new constitution. 
um, including determining who would be the people who would be entitled to enact that constitution or vote on it, which were everybody who was entitled to vote at the general election for the next Eroctus of the Irish Free State, which was to be held on the same day. Okay, so um, on the surface of the constitution, you're getting this, this is a radical break, this is a legal revolution, that's the people of Ireland who are making this constitution, not Westminster. The story, when you look at the hidden provisions, is a little bit more subtle of trying to graft onto a procedure which is being authorized by the previous legal regime of the Irish Free State, which they're about to supplant. Okay, um, well, so Mr. Justice McManaman is no longer here. Um, <clears throat> a sidebar uh, comment on judicial oath breakers. So one of the other provisions, Article 58, effectively said that all judges, so Article 58 of the 1937 Constitution, said that all judges from the Irish Free, free State must either resign or take an oath to uphold the new Constitution. Okay. Um, slight difficulty with that is that all of those judges had previously taken an oath in the same terms to uphold the Irish Free State Constitution. So they could only take their oath to the new Constitution by breaching their oath to the old Constitution, uh, which they all happily did. Um, Okay. Um, in the few minutes that are left, I'm going to try to look over that history um, from both perspectives and then offer some thoughts as to which is the better way to look at it. Okay? If we look at it from the populist or status perspective, uh, what we see is a picture of the Irish people or the Irish nation subsisting through time. Uh, it makes a number of failed attempts to assert itself as a political unity, including a failed attempt in 1916. So they, were, they were trying to will themselves into existence as a state, but they just didn't have enough uh, military power, perhaps popular support, to succeed. Um, there's a successful assertion of political unity in 1922. So I think if we look at it in this popular status way, we couldn't, whatever importance and justificatory importance 1919 might have had. It's only when they're successful or semi-successful in 1922 do we see a new Irish state come into existence as an expression of the political unity of the Irish people. Um, and it, that's the approach we take. We say that we've had one state since 1922 which has seen two constitutional orders, one based on the Irish Free State Constitution, one based on the 1937 Constitution, but the state itself started in um, 1922. If, on the other hand, we take the legal constitutionalist account, we say that there used to be a conventional ultimate rule of recognition that identified the Westminster Parliament as the authoritative legislature for Ireland. That's just what people accepted was the case. They might have argued that it shouldn't have been the case, they might have wanted to change that, but it was accepted that that was the case. Sometime between 1916 and 1937, a new ultimate rule of recognition emerges in Ireland, or part of Ireland, that identifies the Irish people as the authoritative constitution writer for Ireland. Um, I think that is why the judicial, I think that explains two things. First, why so many judges were prepared to break their oath in 1937 and swear loyalty to the new constitution was I think that they had internalized a new ultimate rule of recognition that the Irish people were entitled to do this. The Irish people could make whatever constitutional order they wanted to make. And I also think it explains why the emergence of the new constitution in 1937 is not, by I think, by general historians, seen as a terribly important foundational act. For lawyers, it's hugely important, but for historians, it's generally presented as part of an evolution in Irish history that was occurring. Um, and again, I think that's probably because of how it was felt at the time. People didn't experience it as a revolution, even though in legal terms it was a revolution because it was the final, in this conception, replacement of the Irish people for Westminster as the authoritative legislator for Ireland. Um, that ultimate rule of recognition has founded two constitutional orders and therefore two states. Okay, so that, the answer to that question is the Irish state was, one Irish state was created in 1922 and another Irish state was created in 1937. And if you wanted to get controversial around EU law, you might want to have an argument as to whether that is a bigger change. The answer to that isn't obvious. And then sometime after 1931, the ultimate rule of recognition shifts in Britain so that Westminster is no longer seen as authoritative for Ireland. It wasn't the statute of Westminster itself that did this. It was the 
acceptance that fairly quickly emerged within the UK of how they should treat the Statute of Westminster effectively as a non-repealable statute, and that they would never, although the Statute of Westminster didn't preclude Westminster from legislating for Ireland, it could only do so if it claimed to have the consent of Ireland, they never exercised that power. They accepted that they shouldn't do that unless they were actually asked by Ireland or one of the other dominions. Okay, um, I'm going to run about a minute over time, but what can you do? <laughs> Um, the advantages of the statist account, okay, I think two. It's a plausible historical account of how new political entities emerge, okay? The, the legalist constitutionalist view doesn't have anything to say about how this happens, okay? Um, so the idea of people managing to seize this power and bring into force a new state has an element of truth to it. It also reflects the claims that are made in legal instruments. So the language in all of the documents we've been looking at reflects fairly closely the language of Schmidt. And it's not coincidental that he was writing around the same time and while he had new things to bring, he was also been reflecting the intellectual currents of his time as well. The advantages of the legalist account is that it explains legal systems now. Okay, it allows us to focus on what they are doing now and doesn't get us hung up on the question of how they started. Um, it has a plausible account of political obligation. Okay? It's not the strongest account of political obligation, but it's certainly more plausible than the idea that if enough people had guns 200 years ago, we're therefore under a moral obligation to do something now, which is essentially the Schmittian approach. Um, and also, i um, just mention this following the 1916 commemorations, which I think generally have been very well done, it discourages the privileging of past generations. It discourages ancestor worship. Okay, it discourages us from looking to the past um, and venerating a past generation of having greater wisdom, just being generally morally better people than we are. And if we could only work out what was meant by the terms that they used in 1916 or whatever, we would achieve an enlightened society now. The advantage of the legalist account, I think, is it says that we have responsibility for what we do now. The people of the past were not necessarily our moral superiors, and we should argue for our own values now on our own terms. Thank you very much.